Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our monthly lecture series, Museum After Hours. I'm Trey Johnson, and we are coming to you live from the Kansas Museum of History. Tonight, Phil Dixon will shed new light on the history of Negro League Baseball in Kansas. Dixon is a historian, writer, and co-founder of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. Through the years, Dixon has interviewed more than 500 players, wives, and families of players, providing him with a unique insight into the Negro League baseball experience. He has authored seven nonfiction books and has won numerous awards for his work. Tonight, he will be diving into the history of Negro Leagues baseball in America, which mirrors the racial strife experienced by African Americans in society. The game was plagued by discrimination, racism, and inequity, while its athletes were celebrated for their professionalism, resiliency, and athleticism. The Kansas City Monarchs barnstormed across Kansas and the region to play more than 400 games against local towns between 1920 and 1957. As always, the presentation will be followed by a question and answer period, so feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A feature or the chat, and we'll get to as many as we can after the presentation. So let's all give a nice virtual welcome to Phil Dixon. All right, good evening. And thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction. It's always an honor to do things with the State Historical Society. I've used your facility for many years, uh, going back to the days when they were on 10th Street downtown Topeka. So we're going back a few years. All but, right. Uh, <laughs> wonderful institution. And it's just an honor to be here tonight and to talk about all the things that I've learned about Kansas baseball. So, well, we might as well jump right into it. And let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing this evening. First of all, uh, I'm a Kansas humanities speaker, and I want to thank that organization for giving me an opportunity to travel all over the state to tell these wonderful stories and enlighten the state of Kansas, uh, more specifically, even though I've been everywhere else, but certainly in the state of Kansas, the Kansas humanity has been a great friend. And, uh, perhaps there's someone on here tonight who's probably heard one of my presentations or who may hear this as it comes on Zoom or and then also comes on uh, on social media, so uh, on YouTube. So anyway, uh, I'm going to jump right into it and tell you um, tonight's presentation has a subtitle and it's called The Giants. And the reason I call the, this year's tour The Giants with that subtitle is because uh, the period that I'm going to talk about the most was a period where African Americans didn't appear in the newspaper very often. And typically, there was, they needed a way for fans to identify when a Black baseball team was coming to town. So they labeled the teams the Giants. So if it wasn't the New York Giants and it was called the Giants, you can imagine that there was going to be some Black athletes involved. And so when they started the Negro National League in 1920, they had three teams called the Giants. They had the Chicago Giants, the St. Louis Giants, and the Chicago American Giants. So they had three teams called the Giants, and that's all part of this legacy. And so I wanted to give honor to those men who played under the banner of Giants in small towns and big cities all across America. So this is my honor and my recognition for the Giants. We'll go to the next slide. And, you know, years ago, I wanted to write something that kind of summarized and what I was feeling. So I wrote this poem, and I'm going to recite uh, parts of it here. Then I'm going to go back and let you know what I was thinking about as I was writing it. And it goes like these giants. They come and go. They come fast and slow, then disappear like the last light of the sun in the segregated America. And all we see is their glory. But it gets lonely there when people have forgotten and there's no one here to share. After all, none of us are happy these brothers were treated so unfair. You see, some Giants played for fame. They were athletes in a baseball game who tore their rotator cuffs and came up with throwing. Some down, some of them were crowned, others lost and never found. But most had seen it all. They spent their life in touring cars and buses, barnstorming for glory, but there was no one there to tell their story. 
In a town, the name few can recall, one of these giants really slugged the ball. He had five hits, scored three runs, bases stolen four. I like to know where, I like to know more, but there was no one there to score this game. And for added insult and added shame, the newspapers never bothered, bothered to print his name. You see, some giants made it when they were young. They played the game for fun in a world that was never ready to accept them. I see it was a dirty job for those who paved the way for every time they lift their eyes and try to soar, they had to wonder who would be there to bar the door. See, some giants had arms of steel, men would pay to see. So they put it on display. Some giants had uh, great speed. Even I could watch them run all day. Some giants excelled at hitting ball with bat. And gee, their hitting was advanced. Young boys said, I could do that if I had half the chance. I could be a giant, like bronze men of age 25, young and alive, crowds watching them as they walked and laughed, then asked for memorabilia and autographs. In small towns and big cities, too, people filled the stands and gave their approval with feet and hands, then watched them play with ball and glove. Young girls marveled at their physique and dreamed of kissing them on the cheek, yet these men never could believe you truly loved them. Some giants made it when they were old, like solid gold, playing tricks on father time, still throwing baseballs over dimes, using a talent they still could share, a deep down soul they still could bear. Or maybe there wasn't much there, for even they would say, I didn't have much then, but when I was young, you wouldn't let me in. For surely the wise knew someone would say, 20 years ago, you were one tough cookie, but now you must make room for rookies. But will we ever know living with a nickname you never own? Who Papa, Turkey, or Buck, a nickname on loan that somehow stuck? Are the many years of forgetting the only job you've ever known? Um, these were the giants. And I'm, I'm going to kind of cut it short. The slide is moving. But these, the, this is my point about the giants. And and it's a lengthy poem, but I usually recite and open that up. So we'll go back to the first slide that has Mr. Brewer on it, and then we'll jump back there. All right. So I was thinking about Mr. Chet Brewer. Chet Brewer was from Leavenworth, Kansas. And I happened to uh, meet Mr. Brewer, and uh, he lived in Los Angeles at the time. Now, Chet Brewer is a fascinating individual because when Chet Brewer was a child, he lived in Leavenworth, and his foot was partially run over by a trolley car. So he lost three toes on the important foot that you step down on when you pitch. And so he played his entire career, over 25 years, with a handicap. And after he retired from baseball, he went out to Los Angeles and uh, he began to uh, work with the youth in the community. And when I was coming along, the names of the players that played for Chet Brewer were my heroes. And there were people like Bobby Tolan and Willie Crawford and uh, Doc Ellis. Um, Bob Watson was another one. Enos Cabello. I could go on and on and on. But this was Chet Brewer from Leavenworth, Kansas. And whenever I think of Leavenworth, Kansas, I think of Chet Brewer because he was someone who kind of disappeared and no one really knows much about Mr. Chet Brewer today. I will tell you back in 19, um, I guess it was about 86, 87, I had the pleasure to go out to Los Angeles and uh, spent the day, actually I spent three nights at Chet Brewer's house. And as we were um, talking, I asked Mr. Brewer an important question. I said, Mr. Brewer, let me see your foot. And so I can actually say I saw Chet Brewer's foot missing the toes is, and it probably it's not that exciting a thing, but it was for me. So, and, and once again, I enjoy baseball, so we have fun with that. So that's kind of a, a humorous story that I have about Mr. Chet Brewer. I feel like he should be in the Hall of Fame, and he was a great Kansan, and he's someone who kind of disappeared, and we don't remember much about him. Go to the next slide. And then, of course, uh, in 1980, now I have to admit, I was a kid who uh, followed baseball from childhood. Ever since I saw the first baseball game, I started following and I was in elementary school. And uh, so I knew about Major League Baseball. I collected baseball cards and things like that, read all the books I could get my hands on. But in 1980, I mis met Mr. Mothel. And it was Mr. Mothel who I met in Topeka, Kansas, who began to tell me things about the Negro Leagues that I had never known. And so that's Mr. Mothel here. 
And uh, he's playing that. That particular picture was taken in the Philippines when he was traveling with a black team in the Philippines. His career ended in 1934 because he tore his rotator cuff and couldn't play anymore. So he retired and came back home and lived in Topeka. Now, one interesting thing, when I met Mr. Mopple, he died about two weeks after our conversation. And uh, when he uh, passed, or before he passed, he told a lady that was taking care of him, he said, when this guy comes by, give him all these photographs. And these were photographs that are pretty famous today. One of them was the uh, 1924, what they call Colored World Series, the long panoramic print. And so I came by and, and she gave me these prints. And when I went home, I was looking through some of the artifacts that he had basically given to someone he didn't really know. And turns out that his birthday was August the 13th. And that was kind of ironic because August the 13th is my birthday as well. Uh, to make things or to take it full circle, believe it or not, my wife's birthday is August the 13th. So that's an important day to me. And this is an important man for me. And actually, this gentleman right here, where the people are know it, he is the foundation of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. Because he, when he gave me those prints and I later became a co-founder, it's all connected. So we go to the next slide. And then, uh, of course, playing baseball in Kansas City, uh, I started in Kansas City, Kansas. And uh, the first time I put on a uniform, it was uh, for this guy right here named Sherman Roadblock Jones. And uh, he was uh, coaching for Turner House, but he had pitched for the New York Mets, also pitched for the uh, San Francisco Giants as well. But that was Sherman Roadblock Jones. And so I got good baseball instruction right here in, in Kansas City, Kansas, um, by being connected to people like Sherman Jones. But prior to that, I had started collecting baseball cards. And uh, starting back in the 1964 year, uh, I was in the second grade and uh, I was collecting Beatles cards, believe it or not. I've told this story before. And uh, I made the mistake of taking my Beatles cards to the school. And the teacher took them saying that you can't bring toys to school. So that was the end of my Beatles card collection. That was in 1964. So I ended up uh, going back to the store to get more Beatles cards, but they were so hot, guys. The Beatles were sold out. So the only thing left was baseball cards. And so I started collecting baseball cards and I had a tremendous collection by the time I was um, 19, 20 years old. And the first ever article done about me was not about baseball history or anything like that. It was about me collecting baseball cards. And so when I was writing this part, you know, um, about somewhere down or someone's crown, I was thinking about Sherman Jones. And later on, Sherman Jones was a state representative in Kansas. So some people listening to this uh, or the sound of my voice talking about Sherman Jones might remember him. Go to the next slide. And uh, when I talk about someone crown, someone down, of course, uh, I think about uh, Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth played against the Kansas City Monarchs. He didn't get to Topeka, but he did get as close as Kansas City. And uh, Babe Ruth, of course, uh, played baseball against the Kansas City and um, uh, interesting thing about Babe Ruth, I, I can tell you many stories about Babe Ruth. Uh, the first time I learned about base, baseball, you know, especially in a textbook, it was about Babe Ruth. It was one of our readers. I can't remember his third or fifth grade. And in the book, they talked about Babe Ruth uh, hitting 714 home runs. And, and uh, they talked about his average and all the runs he scored. But if you ask me as a kid, if if uh, 714 home runs was a lot of home runs, I couldn't I couldn't have told you. But between the story, when they were reading the story in the middle, it said that he ate 21 hot dogs between a double header. I didn't know what a double header was, but I knew what 21 hot dogs were. And just like that, I became a Babe Ruth fan. And so he's always a to introduce to young people who want to know about baseball. And then, of course, I played baseball, and every baseball player has a favorite player, and my favorite player is Dick Allen, and that's Dick Allen standing right here. And I always say some are crowned and some are down. Uh, Dick Allen should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. He's not there, and we're still pulling for Dick to get in the Hall of Fame. He died uh, during the uh, pandemic, not from the pandemic, but during the pandemic. But I had a chance to meet him. Uh, Dick Allen was a truculent kind of a um, ball player. Yeah, he wasn't always easy to get along with for some people. I found him to be very easy for me to get along with. 
But uh, the interesting thing about Dick Allen, uh, I remember the first time he played on AstroTurf and uh, the reporter came and asked Dick Allen, so what do you think about this new AstroTurf? And Dick Allen said, if a horse can't eat it, I don't want to play on it. And that was Dick Allen. So go to the next slide. And then I start thinking about them living their life on touring buses. You know, the Kansas City Monarchs were one of the first teams to ever travel by bus. And um, this picture right here came from Mr. Moffell. And uh, uh, this is the Kansas City Monarchs by their first bus back in 1925. And they preceded all of the entertainment that you see across the country, even today, traveling by bus. Somebody had to do it first. And the Kansas City Monarchs were the first. And then also I was interviewing Buck O'Neill and I was thinking about barnstorming and Buck O'Neill told me that uh, from time to time when he was with these little, what he called them, uh, teams that they weren't in the league. They were teams that you got on and tried to work your way up to one of the league teams. So he said they didn't always have the funding. So sometimes their car would break down and they had to go down to the rail yard and hop a train. So I have a picture here. I thought I'd go down and get by a train there. And uh, also when I was thinking about, you know, in the city, the name no one can, no one can recall, I was thinking about some stories that James Coupapa Bell told me. And of course, James Coupapa Bell actually played in Topeka with the 1932 Kansas City Monarchs as they traveled through the region. But he told me a story about him stealing 175 bases in 1933. And he said he only got his credit for about 96 because they kept living the scorebook and there was no one to score the game. And, and I know years later, I, I began to wonder, can a guy really steal 175 bases in a season? Of course, the cool Papa Bell was the guy they said that was so fast he could turn the lights off and get in the bed before the room got dark. And so uh, that was James cool Papa Bell. So he was extremely fast. But I remember uh, Vince Coleman in the mid-1980s, who later came up uh, to the Cardinals, when he was in the minor leagues, he stole 145 bases. And there's a guy named Billy Hamilton who played last year for the Minnesota Twins. But in his minor league career, one season, he stole over 150 bases. So, yeah, it's very doable. But I had my doubts when Kupapa was telling me this story. But a lot of the things that he said turned out to be very true. So he's one of the people I was thinking about as I was telling this story. Go to the next slide. And of course, uh, another guy that uh, I think you ought to know about, his name was George Giles. George Giles was from Manhattan, Kansas. So that's right down the road from Topeka. And uh, the Manhattan team used to come up and play the Topeka Giants all the time. He started off as a bad boy. But by the age of 16, he came to Kansas City to join the Monarchs. And uh, when he came to Kansas City, they said he's not ready yet. They said he needs another couple of years of seasoning. So they sent him out with a black touring team from Kansas City. And the name of the team was the Kansas City Royals. How about that? 1926. Of course, George, George, George Giles comes to the Kansas City Monarchs in 1927. And he's part of a, a great group of guys who came to the Negro League as teenagers and went on to outstanding careers. And a couple of them you might know. You probably heard of Roy Campanella. He was about 15 years old, 15, 16 years old, when he began playing with the grown men in the Negro. Uh, actually, he was in the Negro National League in the East. And then, of course, uh, the Birmingham Black Barons had a guy, he's still around, 90-something years old. His name was Willie Mays. He came up when he was about 15 years old playing with the grown men. So there's a great story about these men who were Played the game when they were young in a world that was never ready to accept them. We go to the next slide. And of course, uh, when I think about the great baseball player who could really hit the ball and they put their uh, playing on display and their hitting, I thought about Josh Gibson. And I remember a story that Jesse Williams, who played for the Kansas City Monarchs, told me. Uh, he told me that, that Josh Gibson, the guy they called the Black Babe Root, he said that Josh came to him one day and they were playing the uh, Homestead Grays and Jesse Williams saw an old broken bat with nails and it was all taped up. So he went to Josh and he said, Josh, this must be your old broken bat. And Josh said, I don't break bats. I wear them out. And that was Josh Gibson. They, they said that he hit over 900 home runs before uh, he died. And amazingly, this guy died at age 38. 
You can imagine that. He was a prolific slugger and someone you might want to know about. Okay, go to the next slide. And then I thought I might talk about these two men, these men here. These were promoters. And uh, over the years, all three of these men brought their baseball teams to Topeka. Now, J.L. Wilkinson and Tom Beard, they were co-owners of the Kansas City Monarchs. And when you think about the Negro Leagues, especially when they organized in 1920, they had all black players and they had uh, all black owners, except for two men. And those two men were J.L. Wilkinson and Tom Baird. Uh, Tom Baird lived in Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, J.L. Wilkinson originally out of Algona, Iowa. But anyway, uh, these were two men that that uh, formed the Kansas City Monarchs. Uh, T.Y. Baird, I like to tell the story that T.Y., when he went around promoting baseball, he only used his middle initials or his initials, T.Y. Beard. And the reason he did that, because he didn't want people to know, especially his his middle name, because it was his family name. And his name was Thomas Younger Beard. And when you put Younger with the state of Missouri and Kansas, what do you get? You get outlaws. And uh, he was part of that family. And of course, J.L. Wilkinson, uh, I talked about him earlier. He was the first one to put a bus on the road uh, and tour a team in bus. And also he's considered one of the fathers of night baseball. And then also there's this guy right here named Ray Doan out of Muscatine, Iowa. Great promoter, doesn't get a lot of recognition, but should. And Ray Doan is famous for inventing donkey baseball. And you can see some great things about donkey baseball if you go out to YouTube. But this is the creator, Ray Doan out of Muscatine, Iowa. And he was the promoter for the House of David. And he teamed up with, especially with Tom Baird, and they booked the House of David. Of course, the House of David played right there in Topeka as well. So we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> when you, people ask me, say, why would these teams come to Topeka of all places? You know, they had their leagues. So they had teams in the Negro National League. And of course, they're playing Chicago and they're playing St. Louis and <clears throat> uh, different major cities. But they always had to come back to Topeka. And I, and, and towns like Topeka, especially in Kansas. And I use this uh, pay slip to kind of illustrate that example. So for instance, if you look at the Milwaukee Bears, uh, they're playing their last game against the Milwaukee Bears. And this was the Kansas City Monarchs cut of the gate receipts. And this game was played in Kansas City and they received $88.99. But a, a week later or a few days later, they're in Topeka and their share of the gate was $1,034. So you see why the Kansas City Monarchs continue to barnstorm into some of these uh, towns around Kansas. And you can see Topeka had one of the largest gates of, of this particular spreadsheet right here by, by a large margin. So Topeka <clears throat> is always going to be an important city uh, for uh, Negro League baseball teams and especially the Kansas City Monarchs. So this is a great place for Negro League baseball history. Go to the next slide. Of course, and then I think about some of the great players who who came to some of these small towns. And one of them I talk about is Root Foster. Root Foster uh, had ball players from Kansas that were star players on his team. Now, Root Foster is the one there with the Derby. He's a he's a top of uh, my next book. Anyway, Root Foster had a guy from Topeka by the name of Bingo DeMoss. Yeah, he saw Bingo DeMoss play in 1910 for two teams in Chicago. Uh, the Kansas City, he was with the uh, Oklahoma Monarchs when they traveled to uh, Chicago. Then he returned with the Kansas City, Kansas Giants and played in Chicago. Rube liked this guy so much that he bought Bingo DeMoss from Topeka, Kansas to play for his Chicago American Giants. Also, there was another guy by the name of Sam Struthers, who was also with Rube's team in 1910 who was from Clay Center, Kansas. So Kansas always plays a prominent role. And of course, there's Rube and his brother, Willie, are two brothers in the Hall of Fame, both of them outstanding pitchers in their day. Go to the next slide. And of course, I like to talk about the House of David. Now I mentioned Ray L. Dome was one of their promoters. Well, the House of David played many games against the Kansas City Monarchs. And uh, they actually came into Kansas in as early as 1930. 
and they played a night baseball game at Independence. But by 1931, 32, 33, they're playing in Topeka, Kansas. So people had a chance to see this team. They were part of a religious cult out of Benton Harbor, Michigan. And there's a great documentary right now that's out called, um, it's called House of David, Life Everlasting. And you can't miss me because I'm in the documentary and um, I'm the only black guy in it. So you, you can't miss me at all. But it's a great documentary. It gives you the history of this team. And by the way, this team invented a few things in their colony that we still use today. And one of them is the automatic pin stacker uh, for bowling. The House of David invented that. And then uh, also another one was, um, they don't get credit for it, but they were at the World's Fair when the waffle cone was created. And the House of David was the you know, the instigators of creating the waffle cone. So if you ever had a waffle cone, you partaking in some of the House of David's activities. So I had the pleasure of going there uh, in 2022, and uh, I learned so much uh, from visiting uh, their colony. It's not much there today, but it was they had a fantastic history, and they had an amazing baseball team, and Topeka had a chance to see them fly. Go to the next slide. And of course, some other people who came to Topeka uh, with the House of David. One of them is uh, Grover Cleveland Alexander. And I always talk about Grover Cleveland Alexander. He had a marvelous Major League Baseball career. I think he won over 370 some odd games. Uh, he still holds the National League record for the most shutouts by a National League pitcher uh, career. And uh, But when he retired from the big leagues, in 1931, he joined the House of David and toured the country, and he would come out and pitch one inning a night. And then sometime he couldn't pitch that one inning, and I always tell people that he was known to take a nip, and that's why he couldn't pitch that one inning. And there was one town that he went to, and I have this little uh, blurb here, the town was seething with anger when Alex failed to show but Clarence Mitchell saved the day. And Clarence Mitchell was another major league pitcher. And he pitched for both sides and beat himself two to one. So that was Grover Cleveland Alexander. And there's a great movie about Grover Cleveland Alexander. Now, you know that name, Grover Cleveland Alexander. He's named after a president. And they did a movie about his life story. And believe it or not, another president played Grover Cleveland. It was Ronald Reagan. So if you get a chance to see that, it was called The Winning Team with Doris Day and uh, Ronald Reagan, the life story of Grover Cleveland Alexander. And then, of course, they also had a female player who came through. Her name was Babe Ditcherson. A lot of young ladies don't know about Ditcherson anymore, but they need to. She was an outstanding player. She would come through and pitch one inning, and then she would go and sit down for the night. Pretty much the same uh, thing that Grover Cleveland did, pitch one inning, take the rest of the night off. But she was known for her spitball. And Burley Grimes, the guy who could last throw the spitball legally in the major league, said that her spitball was better than his. Well, Babe goes on to be an Olympic star, 1932 Olympics. Uh, she's in the Golf Hall of Fame, and she was a professional basketball player as well. But most people don't know about her, and they certainly don't know about her career as a baseball player, and they probably have never heard that she pitched in Topeka. So go to the next slide. Okay, and then in my poem, I talk about some giants were good when they were old, like solid gold. But I also had to think about there were many players who never lived to be old, and Ruth Foster who was served as what they call the father of Negro League Baseball. And he organized the Negro National League in that building right there that still stands in Kansas City. That was in 1920. And uh, he only lived to be 51 years old. And so uh, there were other great players. Bill Lindsay, a great pitcher. They said that he was one of the five greatest pitchers in the world. And he was out of Lexington, Missouri, died at age 24. And uh, Right up to the time, and one of the last people I have is Don Wilson. Don Wilson was another Chet Brewer player, and uh, he's died, he died from carbon monoxide uh, poisoning uh, when I was uh, in high school. So these were some great players, and um, all of them in some one way or another have some kind of connection to this area. And of course, Bill Lindsay actually picked, pitched in Topeka. Henry Milton played in Topeka, and uh, so those two definitely have Topeka, Topeka connections. Go to the next slide. 
And when you think of someone who played well past their prime, you got to think about someone like Satchel Paige and, and how they said he played tricks on Father Time. Uh, Satchel Paige came into uh, professional baseball, uh, especially in the Negro League in 1927. And he pitched his last major league game in 1965 for the Kansas City A's. And he was 59 years old. And if you know anything about the Negro Leagues, or if you know nothing about the Negro Leagues, you've probably heard of Babe Ruth and you've probably heard of Satchel Page. And so anyway, this is Satchel Page here. And of course he was baseball's oldest rookie, 1947. And of course he became the oldest player to ever pitch a game in the majors. And um, that was uh, in 1965. Uh, he pitched three innings for the Athletics and gave up uh, one hit, a double to Karya Strzemski, and struck out uh, one batter, Bill Mumblecat, the pitcher. And you get those names really, you understand those names really well when you collect baseball cards. So that's Satchel Page. And of course, Satchel Page played in Topeka many times, many times. So uh, we'll go to the next slide. And of course, I think about the famous nicknames. And of course, when you think of a baseball today, uh, if you think about the Kansas City Royals, uh, they have a catcher by the name of Sal Salvador Perez, and his nickname is Salvi. But in the old days, they didn't just shorten your name. They looked at, you know, how you walked, how you talk. Uh, the veteran players would sit on the bench and give you these kind of names. They watched at what you ate and, um, they knew everything that they could learn about you. And that's how you got your nickname. And this particular player right here, I just happened to uh, spend some time with his daughter when I was up in Detroit last week. She sang the uh, national anthem. Her two, actually two daughters sung the national anthem up in Detroit when I was there. But anyway, Turkey Stearns was with the Montgomery Gray Sox about 1922. He was out shagging balls and there were two veterans sitting on the bench. And they looked at Turkey running across the field. And one of them said, look at that guy. He runs with his chest stuck out. And the other guy said, yeah, he runs like a turkey. And just like that, he had his name. And so when I went to Detroit, they were celebrating Turkey Stearns. Most people don't even know his first name was Norman. And uh, he's being widely celebrated today. They even gave a jersey with Turkey Stearns jersey with his number eight on it but when he played for the Detroit Stars. So we go next slide. And then uh, as I traveled across the country, I would uh, interview ball players and they would pull pictures out of their scrapbooks. And this was a picture that uh, they pulled the Grand Cafe. They pulled this one out. It was a guy in Atlanta. And they thought this sign was so unusual that they got out of the bus and took a picture but next to this sign. This was probably about 1948. They're taking this picture. And I spoke uh, in Oklahoma, right outside Tulsa this past year in Claremore. And there was a, a guy, he was about 90 years old, and he said those signs were up and down the highway all through that part of Oklahoma. And if you look at it real closely, you can see it's at the Venita exit. And I was just at that exit two weeks ago when I went to throw out the first pitch in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So as I travel, I think about what these guys saw on the road as they were traveling. And it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's really revealing uh, what it makes me think about and how I want to preserve this history and how I ought to write about it. And so this poem comes out of all of that experience. Go to the next slide. And of course, there are uh, ball players like uh, these two gentlemen here. Uh, one of them is, uh, uh, this is actually, uh, they're wearing the Union Giant uniform. One of them is Ed Dwight. And now Ed Dwight uh, lived in Kansas City, Kansas. And uh, Ed Dwight uh, played for the Kansas City Monarchs. He also played for the Indianapolis ABCs and, of course, played for the Union Giants. But Ed, uh, his uh, wife was one of my big boosters, and she had many stories about Eddie Dwight. Uh, one of the things that Eddie Dwight is most known for, though, is that his son was the first African-American astronaut in the space program, and is Eddie Dwight Jr., and that's D-W-I-G-H-T. So you can go uh, look that up on um, social media, anywhere. You can find that, that information. But this is his dad. He was a baseball player. And uh, all of these guys played in this region. And when I say this region, you're going to have towns like Wichita and especially Topeka and every place else in between that they played. 
And of course, there's a Bullet Rogan wearing a Giants uniform there, uh, because remember all the teams I talk about named Giants. Now, Bullet Rogan, I want to say something special about him. Now, he's on the left here. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is Wilbur Bullet Rogan. I've written an entire book about him. And I happen to think that Wilbur Bullet Rogan is the greatest all around baseball player that has ever lived. When I say all around, that's someone who can pitch and hit. Now, right now, there's a lot of talk about Shawnee, Atani, and but I tell you what, he hasn't measured up to what Bullet Rogan did just yet. Bullet Rogan uh, is from Kansas City, Kansas, originally born in Oklahoma City, and he was raised just uh, walking distance from where I live. And uh, there were many people who still knew Rogan. So I was able to interview those people going back 40 years and tell his story in a, in a great detail. Uh, so anyway, this is Bullet Rogan. So why do I think he's the greatest baseball, all around baseball player that ever lived? Well, first of all, he's a home run hitter. He had over 400 home runs. Now, Babe Ruth hit more. but And Babe Ruth also pitched. But Babe Ruth didn't win 400 games, and Bullet Rogan did. In addition to that, Bullet Rogan was a 300 hitter. And he rarely struck out. Babe Ruth struck out over a thousand some odd times in his career. And in addition to that, Bullet Rogan was what they called a 10 second man. He could run the 100 yard dash in less than 10 seconds. Now we know Babe Ruth couldn't do that. And that was Wilbur Bullet Rogan. So I celebrate Bullet Rogan and uh, I've written this book about Rogan. And uh, you can go and check it out at any Kansas library. And uh, it's called Wilbur Bullet Rogan and the Kansas City Monarchs. So you can learn about most of the things I'm talking about in this documentary or this, this uh, Zoom tonight. And of course, Mary, uh, Rogan married a farm girl. And her name is Catherine. And uh, Catherine, interesting, uh, she was raised in, uh, born actually, she was raised in Hugo, Colorado, but she was born in Cawker City, Kansas. I've had the pleasure of going there. And if it's any Kansans on the here uh, who travel around the uh, state, they know that uh, Cawker City, big attraction is the world's largest ball of twine. And so you can't make this stuff up. You just got to go visit it. But that's where Catherine Rogan and his wife came from. So these are true Kansans in, in a way of speaking. So go to the next slide. And of course, uh, this past year, uh, John Buck O'Neill, many people know who John Buck O'Neill is because he was uh, one of the last connections that many people had to seeing an actual Negro League player. And this is uh, me with Buck O'Neill, and that's my wife here, the August 13th family, right, with Buck O'Neill. And uh, I recently wrote a book about Buck O'Neill, and I use QR codes in it. And you, you see these QR codes, and this is the book, and it's called The Rookie, His Words, His Voice. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I want to take advantage of technology. And uh, actually, you can hear Buck O'Neill's voice by just scanning those QR codes. And uh, it's an it's a interesting thing uh, to do this. Uh, and, and I might also mention that the first time I saw QR codes used in this manner, had nothing to do with baseball. It was people keeping their family history. So I'm gonna encourage you to take those recordings that you have and continue to record people. And believe me, you can turn these QR codes into history books, living history books for your own family. So in our, my book, you had a chance to hear me interviewing Buck O'Neill in 1985, some of the earliest recordings that you'll ever hear of Buck O'Neill. And my, my young son is in this, uh, picture here and uh, he's a uh, professor now at the KCK Community College and he's six foot four so he's taller than everybody in that picture right now. Uh, go to the next slide. And then of course Topeka's uh, legacy in baseball didn't start with the Negro League. Actually it started with Bud Fowler and Bud Fowler was inducted into Cooperstown uh, in 2022 Dave Winfield gave a speech for Doug Fowler, Bud Fowler, excuse me. And uh, Bud played in Topeka in 1886. He batted 340 in 67 games. And so Topeka actually had broken the minor league color line as far back as 1886. So there's a lot of reasons to celebrate what happened to Topeka. Not only uh, the athletes who were there, uh, but, you know, you go back. So you had before the turn of the century, you had athletes, then you had the Negro League athletes who came later. And so there's plenty to celebrate and there's a lot to be proud of if you're from Topeka. 
And then I would also uh, say that uh, for me, coming back to Topeka is always important because some of the earliest pictures I picked up, I picked up from Topeka at antique stores on the Negro Leagues, believe it or not. And uh, this was in addition to uh, the Marvel collection. So I have pictures on my wall that I picked up in Topeka in 1980. So it's always an honor to come back to Topeka and tell the story about baseball as it relates to uh, our great capital of Kansas. So we go to the next slide. And then usually when I, when I end my uh, program, I always end it with some poetry. So I thought I would end with some poetry tonight. I know we got thrown off a little bit in the middle, so I want to keep you too long. And I do want to answer some questions if I can. And so there are some other guys I didn't get a chance to talk about tonight. And one of them is Topeka Jack Johnson, who was the original manager of the Topeka Giants. And they were the first ever professional black baseball team in the state of Kansas. Didn't start in Kansas City. It started in Topeka with the Topeka Giants. And so, but anyway, uh, this is called The Stars That Did Not Shine. And it goes something like this. Uh, and I'll use some of the names I had tonight. My name is Bingo DeMoss. My name is Wilbur Buller Rogan, but my age is way beyond. I spent my prime in baseball shoes, but my sporting days are gone. Now I'm just one more forgotten fakes among the blackface teams, an old dark horse that came the course they called the Negro Leagues. And I worked the fields in Tennessee, but I dreamed of better days. So I left the plow, the picking bag to join the homestead grays. And all summer long, we played the states and headed south for fall. Through rain and dust, we rode the bus so we could play baseball. Now we played for love, we played for pride, and we seldom made much more. The bread, the beans, the whole deal. Bugs. The roads were crowded on rule. The all night rise, the seedy side came with the life I chose, but we may do when we came through, because darn it, we were pros. Now we played in the shadow of the bay, Blue Garrick and the rest, then stood behind that big leaf fence while they were called the best. But we played them well and we gave them hell with every hidden pitch, then stayed behind that color line and watched those boys get rich. But did they see Josh Gibson swing or Satru throw a stuff? Or can you imagine how bad it feels when your best is not good enough? When clouds roll in across the sky to hide the brightest moon, that's when you'll find some stars don't shine, some folks were born too soon. So God bless you, Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays and all. You wore our numbers on your backs when you played big league ball. And every time you hit one out, slid or laid one down, you carried us from that old town to the halls of Cooperstown. Now, my name is John Buck O'Neill. My name is John Bud Fowler, but you might not remember that. I'm just one more along the score who played with ball and bat. But everyone, when you seek out heroes and you praise this great pastime, remember these old brown-faced pros from Topeka, some of them, the stars that did not shine. Thank you. And I'm going to open up for question and answer from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Phil. Uh, let's get our Q&A rolling. Well, starting off, uh, Paul here said, great presentation. <laughs> thank, thank you, Paul. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, well, first off, I have to know, uh, what was Chet Brewer's reaction to asking him to see his foot? <laughs> well, he, th he thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, we had talked about his foot. And, and the reason why it was important, because they were going to amputate his leg. And there were two black doctors in Leavenworth who actually saved his leg. And for us, they saved baseball history. And, and for me, uh, I would just say this. Uh, when I was uh, in elementary school, I played on a little pickup team. All we had was blue jeans and a white shirt and, and a blue hat. And we played in a local park called Cleveland Park in Kansas City, Missouri. And I had a, a classmate. He said, hey, my uh, cousin's going to come and talk to us about baseball. His cousin comes. His name is Reggie Smith, and he's playing for the Boston Red Sox. He was a rookie. And so he comes out and talked to us little kids there, and that locked me in because I had never met a baseball player. And that year, they went to the World Series. So now I'm seeing a guy who I knew, who I just met on TV playing baseball, and it really impressed me. What's interesting is that this was a Chet Brewer player. Chet Brewer got him to the big leagues. And when he got to the big leagues, he got to me. And today I'm presenting because of people I met like Reggie Smith. So it's, these things didn't happen by accident. I think they were meant, meant to be. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, 
Well, Ted here uh, also gave you a, a, a thanks, a wonderful presentation. Uh, he said he learned so much about the game and its Kansas connections and asks uh, if you had a chance to talk to Richie Allen about his time with the Cardinals. We didn't talk about his time with the Cardinals. We uh, talked about uh, him growing up. Uh, one of the questions I did ask him, uh, when I started uh, following baseball, <clears throat> he was he was called Richie Allen. So I asked him, why'd you change your name to Dick? And he said, because my mother never called me Richie. He said, they just made that up when I came to the big league, some writer. He said, I wanted to be called what my mother called me. And so he made them change it. And so, I, you know, from time to time, I'll hear, see someone on the Internet, they'll ask the question, why did he change his name? I actually got a chance to, to hear him tell the story. Uh, fascinating guy, just a tremendous baseball player. And, uh, and it, was just, it was just an honor to, to meet him after following him for all those years. Yeah, great. That, that was a great meet for me. And I was fortunate enough to have my camera. I've met many baseball players and didn't have my camera. Uh, that's a whole story in itself, a whole <laughs> different story. Uh, how did uh, the museum come to be in Kansas City? Well, what's the story behind that? Well, after when I was in Topeka, 1980, uh, I was working for a retail store called the Dokwa Alco Retail Stores. And I had uh, worked for them in several cities. Uh, I've been on Colorado Springs. I worked for them in Wichita, did some stuff in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then they moved me to Topeka. And I said, well, I'm, I'm ready to go back home. So I, so after Mafu died, I took those pictures and I came back to Kansas City. And uh, I went to see a guy named Horace Peterson. And um, so I started talking about the Negro Leagues in ways that people hadn't talked about it. And uh, so um, in 1990, five of us went down and incorporated the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. <clears throat> and most people know about Buck O'Neill and they, they always call it Buck O'Neill's dream and things like that. But the, the most knowledgeable guy on that, on that group was the youngest guy. My name is right under Bucks on the incorporation. And uh, that was myself. And that was what well, we're talking about over 40 years ago. And, uh, you know, it, it just, it's just, I, you know, I've seen the, the interest grow and it's still growing and, and I'm still learning every day. I've got about five books I'm trying to read right now and <laughs> including writing one. And uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's just fascinating. And, and so the Negro Leagues, uh, is, is still a hot property. I, I might also mention, uh, you know, they give these uh, major league tributes to Negro Leagues. <clears throat> and so they have like, I just came from Detroit when they had the Negro League weekend. Well, the first ever modern day Negro League weekend was given in Kansas City and I was part of that. And, uh, and so now uh, they're given all over, all over the country. And, uh, but some of those things started just from uh, some humble beginnings of meeting Mr. Mothel in Topeka. And, 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 when, you, and when you think of the Negro uh, Leagues Baseball Museum, you won't ever think of Topeka or you won't think of Mr. Mothel. But believe me, he's there in spirit and his spirit helped to get it created. <laughs> That's incredible. Are, are you still interviewing uh, players today? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> all, all the time. Uh, when, I was, uh, in, uh, when I was in Detroit and I, and I was talking to Turkey Stern's uh, uh, daughter, uh, evidently his granddaughter recently written a book about Turkey. And I'm looking at the pictures in the book. And I said, I got a picture at home I've never released of your father. And so I came back and, uh, and uh, uh, I got the picture. I'm making a copy of it now. And it came from Mr. Mothel, believe it or not. I've never, I've never let it go. And it was Turkey Stearns in 1932 when they were traveling in Mexico. So I, I thought it was important to get that picture to the family. And, uh, but yeah, oh, she had great stories and uh, about her dad and, and so uh, it just kind of remarkable, but yeah. And, and there, I, when I was in Topeka earlier this year, I found a ball player in Topeka who played uh, three games with the Kansas City Monarchs in 1951. No one knew about him. And he came out to my uh, presentation and signed books that night. And uh, that was at the Topeka library. So, yeah. So yeah, you, if the work goes on, you don't get as many players, but now we're into grandkids and, right. and some, cool. some of the children and, 
you know, that kind of thing. But the history goes on and uh, we're still finding out new information and I'm still learning. And the other thing is I did so many interviews. When I go back and listen to interviews I recorded on tape recorder, I even have one I recorded on an eight track. How about that? But when I when I go back and I listen to these interviews, I'm always hearing things that have never been printed. So <laughs> I'm just working fast and furious, furiously to try to get some of this information out. Well, I'm still young enough to enjoy it. <laughs> I'm sure each each time you you play one of those interviews and listen, I'm sure you just pick up on on things that you probably don't even remember when it took place. Oh, yeah. I know I've run across things like that too. Yeah, it's it's kind of, it's it's really amazing uh, that I've been doing this for forty some odd years. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I've always loved baseball. I coached for thirty some odd years, and and uh, but. Uh, I never thought I would be telling these stories and and I just wanted to learn about baseball and and appreciate these men who were in my community they were in communities all over the country and they were just being overlooked and so trying to tell their story and then seeing people today appreciate this history and begin to talk about these men and uh, you know I probably need to write a book about Mr. Moppo because uh uh, he's a story in itself. And then Bingo DeMoss, he should be in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. That was a great person. And, and uh, I will tell you this, they have uh, in the Baseball Hall of Fame for Kansas, uh, there are 13 people that went in at one time. And I was able to give a speech for them. This has been about 10 years ago now. But so uh, Topeka, Jack Johnson, and DeMoss, uh, they are in the can and Mopple too or in the Kansas Baseball Hall of Fame, I got to go back and get Sam Struthers in there as well. Uh, <laughs> Tim Struthers, who is a great player. What does that process look like, trying to get a player inducted? Well, you just have to write the history and then, then go out and lobby on their behalf <laughs> and um, be able to tell the story. I would say uh, uh, Billy Rogan is also, he's in the Kansas Baseball Hall of Fame, and uh, he's in the Kansas Sports Hall of Fame as well, and he should be. He should be just tr tremendous talent. And uh, and when you think of Kansas City, Kansas, uh, there's, he's the only uh, Hall of Famer from Kansas City, Kansas. And so we need more to celebrate uh, Rogan in his own, own hometown. So we're Absolutely. working on that as well. Yeah, <laughs> still working on that. Uh, David here is asking, uh, uh, he said that he met George Giles many years ago in Manhattan. Uh, can you say something about his grandson, Brian, who played in the major leagues? Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> I, I have a picture of Brian holding up a picture of his favorite baseball card, and it was in the Jet magazine, and it was from a, a baseball series that I produced in uh, 1987. And so I thought that was interesting uh, that it got into Jet magazine. Jet's out of business now, but that was a big deal back then. But yeah. Uh, George Giles himself didn't get a chance to play in the major leagues because of uh, the color line. And, uh, but his grandson, actually his son played in the Giants organization, but his grandson actually made it up to the big leagues. And I had a chance to see Brian play. And uh, I remember George Giles coming to Royal Stadium to see his grandson play. And that was quite an honor to see, to see his son step where he could not. And George Giles was just a fabulous guy. Uh, Fabulous. Uh, uh, if you ever sit down and talk to him, he had all these witty, witty sayings. Uh, <laughs> I asked him well, how hard could Satchel Page throw. He said Satchel could throw uh, harder than lightning could bump a stump. And uh, <laughs> an another guy who was a great two strike hitter, Hurley McNair, George Giles really respected him. He said that guy could take two strikes on Jesus Christ and get a base hit on the third one. So, but yeah, you, you had to sit around. He was quite the fellow uh, to talk baseball with. And uh, so I have, and, and he was quite a letter writer. I probably have about 25 letters oh, wow. that uh, he wrote me over the years. So a whole collection of letters. Uh, he was one of the more, more prolific letter writers of Negro Leagues. Well, and uh, as, as uh, historians know, that is just more content for us to, to comb through and interpret. So thank goodness he did that. Yes, <laughs> indeed. indeed. Um, so tonight we've, we've heard some pretty awesome uh, nicknames. Do you have a particular favorite ball player nickname? 
Well, it's it's hard to top cool Papa Bell. That is that that was that's my number one so far. But I wanted to hear from you. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, oh man, that, that that's that's a good one. There was another guy. Uh, he was he was married to a blues singer named Clara Smith. His name was he batted from both sides. His name was Two Side Wesley. <laughs> and of course, there was uh, um, Ted Ratcliffe who could pitch a game, and then he'd come back in the second game of the doubleheader and catch. And he was called Double Duty Ratcliffe. Um, so oh there's so many great great nicknames uh yeah and that, and and like i said the veteran players would look at a young guy and 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 they're going to look at you and that's how you got your got your nickname and and so yeah it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a, probably a great book could be written about how nicknames came about yeah well okay you got to add it to your list <laughs> yeah that's true. I got my list is stacked already, but yes. hey, who knows? You never know. Sometimes yeah, you, you never know. <laughs> yeah, you might you might change direction, right? So, and then I do want to thank people for also bearing with us tonight. It was kind of we had that little interruption in the middle, and it felt like a rain delay. So, uh, so <laughs> well, I hope I, I hope they took their rain check. Yeah. Well, we we did not drop anybody, so uh, everybody hung on through it. Uh, so we, we have a devoted crowd here at Museum After Hours. So uh, thank you all for, for watching. Uh, and Phil, thank you so much for this, this presentation. Uh, we've, we've all learned a lot and <laughs> had, a, had a lot of fun with it. And, and once again, baseball itself is fun. And I know for me to go around and tell these stories and, and we, we have more fun even in person than we have right here. <laughs> so, so if you ever get a chance to hear me come to your community and I I try to go to every community that I can it's large or small and I've just you know had the opportunity to meet so many people in Kansas and Topeka is one of my favorite towns and I'll be in Wichita on the 30th and uh, I'll be down there talking about the Monrovians who in 1925 uh, they had a famous game that been written about over and over again they beat the Ku Klux Klan so uh that's that's history I'll be talking about down there uh, when I get to Wichita on the 30th. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody here, you got to make it. If you don't have anything to do, got to go to the 30th uh, on the 30th. Listen to Phil talk about this and absolutely go to his website, pick up some books and support the great work that, that he's been doing. Uh, so thank you again, Phil. Uh, and I hope everyone here can come out again uh next month on september 13th at 6 30 to hear jim minnick talk about the deadliest tornado on record the tornado of udall kansas so from everyone here at museum after hours thanks so much for watching and have a great evening bye all